Shalom, I'm Rabbi Jason Sobel, and I want to welcome you to this study on signs and secrets of the Messiah. The purpose of the study is to help see God's miracles from the book of John in a fresh new way that increases our faith in them for our lives, and it also helps us to see the miracles in the ministry of Jesus in HD high definition. You know, deeper spiritual truths are often not obvious on the surface. But as you dig, they can be found, and it's the glory of the King to seek them out, to meditate and search these secrets and mysteries. Jesus gives us a great example on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. He's walking with his disciples, and he begins to open the law, the writings, and the prophets, and show how they all point to him. And they said, did our hearts not burn within us after their eyes had been opened and realized that it had been Jesus who had been journeying with them all along? That's what I hope we experience in part. But before we begin, there are a few things that are important to understand. The Hebrew name of Jesus is Yeshua. This is a name that he would have been called by his parents and disciples. And I will be using Yeshua as well as Jesus throughout the series. Something else that is important to know is that Hebrew and Greek is alphanumeric. This means that every letter has a number assigned to it. In fact, there are no Roman numerals in the Bible. You actually write numbers with letters in Hebrew. This means that every word in the Bible, both old and new, has a numerical value. Words that share the same numerical value often have a connection that gives us deeper insights and understanding. An example of that is the number 13. We tend to think of that in the West as an unlucky number, but in the Bible and in Jewish thought, it is a very important and beautiful number. The value of echad, to become one, or to unite, or unity, has a numerical value of 13. And the Hebrew word for love, ahava, has a numerical value of 13. Why? Because love 13 is about oneness 13. It's about becoming one with the one we love. So for example, the husband and the wife, the two shall become echad, basar echad in Hebrew. And it's also significant to fish in Hebrew has the numerical value of 13. Why does that all connect? We must fish 13 from a place of love 13 to help people unite 13 and become one 13 with the Lord. But of course, there is more. The great love chapter in the New Testament is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And guess how many verses it has? 13 verses. This is no coincidence. Even though the chapters and verses in the Bible come later and are not in the original manuscripts, God knew all of this from the beginning. So the Bible often uses numbers and patterns, and there is a significance to many of these numbers and patterns. But for the sake of clarity, I want us to understand that we don't make doctrines or build theology based on the numbers, but they do illustrate and give us deeper insights of obvious spiritual truths that are in the biblical text. Also in the study, I'm going to reference Jewish tradition, several sources that come from a Jewish perspective, and many of these are centuries old and ancient. And these sources help us open up the Jewish meaning of many of the passages that we're going to be looking at and their connection to the Messiah and the New Testament. Just as Christian pastors and teachers use multiple sources to explain Scripture, we are bringing together the essential sources from a Jewish perspective to study the Messiah. And with that, I'm excited to jump into the first miracle of the Messiah, the signs and secrets of transformation. Messiah's first miracle occurred during a wedding. 
and it points to the abundant blessing that comes from our relationship with Messiah Yeshua. His changing the water into wine was not merely a random act of kindness, as many seem to look at it at first. God is sovereign over every seemingly insignificant detail. And the fact that this miracle involved wine and occurred at a Jewish wedding is highly significant. But we have to ask the question, why did this first miracle happen at a wedding of all the places? Throughout scripture, God's relationship with his people is often symbolized spiritually and prophetically as God being married to his people. God is the groom, Israel is the bride. Ezekiel 16, eight says this, again, I passed by you and saw you and behold, you were truly at the time of love. I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I swore to you and entered into covenant with you, says Adonai, so you became mine. A beautiful verse of talking about God marrying his people. And the marriage imagery of God to his people in the Old Testament is evident in Yeshua's first miracle at a wedding. The miracle was actually a prophetic sign of the coming messianic wedding that we will celebrate with Yeshua Jesus, our bridegroom in the messianic kingdom. Yeshua is Israel's bridegroom and he's also ours. It's symbolic of God saying, I'm going to reward you and bring you to me as my wife. So it makes sense that this miracle of abundance occurred at a wedding because Yeshua is the bridegroom and he was coming for his bride. Hosea 2, 19 and 20 says this, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and love and compassion. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. God wants to be your betrothed. Yeshua performed this first miracle at a wedding feast as a sneak preview of the ultimate wedding celebration, the messianic wedding supper of the lamb spoken of by the prophets in the book of Revelation. May that day come soon. It's gonna be such a great celebration. But I wanna look with you at another important detail in this miracle the miracle and the secret of the third day. The miracle of the water into wine happened on the third day. But why the third day? What's so significant? Let's explore the secret of the third day to uncover some of the deeper truths about why Yeshua did this first miracle on this specific day. The story of this miracle opens with the words, on the third day. There was a wedding at Cana in the Galilee. The third day of the week is significant in Jewish tradition. In fact, there are three parts of the Jewish wedding. There is the Shadukin, which is the matchmaking. Then there is the betrothal, known as the Arusin. And then there is the Kedushin, which is the setting apart or the sanctification and culminates in Nisuin which is the actual wedding coming together. So there are three parts, the matchmaking, the engagement, and the wedding. Many Jewish people are married on the third day. And the reason for this is that the third day was the only day in creation that God blessed twice. And so many Jewish people get married on the third day because they believe it is a day doubly blessed. It is an auspicious day, but of course there is more. Why does this miracle happen on the third day? Well, because it is about a miracle of abundance. It comes from our relationship with the Messiah. 
So therefore, we have this miracle performed on a day that's doubly blessed, symbolizing a double portion and of fruitfulness, that our marriages and our relationship with God should be doubly good. But of course, there is more. The third day is the day that God revealed himself on Mount Sinai. God comes down on the third day and reveals his glory. And in Jewish thought, when God comes down on Mount Sinai, he actually married his people on the third day, which is exactly connected to this miracle happening on the third day. So God revealed his glory to Israel on the third day, and he's revealing his glory in the person of Yeshua on the third day, bringing us into union with him. But of course, there is more. The third day is a day of restoration. The third day is a day of resurrection. Abraham lifted up his eyes, and on the third day, he saw Mount Moriah from a distance, the place that he was ultimately going to offer his son Isaac, which is a picture of the death of the Messiah. And so the prophet Hosea also talks about this. In Hosea 6, he says, For the Adonai, the Lord has torn you, but he will heal us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live. So we see the third day pointing to the death and resurrection of Yeshua. Amazing. All of this happens on the third day connected to this first miracle that Yeshua does. But of course, there is more, okay? Why is this the first miracle that Yeshua does of all the miracles that he could have performed? Think about it for a moment. What's the first miracle Moses performed when he came to redeem the children of Israel out of Egypt? He turned the water into blood. Yeshua is the greater than Moses. John is trying to show him as the prophet like Moses promised in the Torah. So he doesn't turn the water into blood. He turns the water into wine. Why? Because wine is the symbol of the abundance and fruitfulness and blessing of the messianic kingdom. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. By turning the water into wine, he's declaring, I'm the greater than Moses, and I'm giving you a sneak preview and a taste of the coming messianic kingdom, the new wine promised in a number of different places. So incredible. And why does he do the miracle with six stone pots? The reason is that six in Hebrew is the number of connection. But there's more, I'll explain this. Man was created on the sixth day. He fell on the sixth day. And as a result of the fall, lost six things. So when Messiah comes, he does the miracle with the six stone pots because he's restoring the connection between heaven and earth and restoring the original fruitfulness of creation that was lost by the fall. And when he dies on the cross, he dies on a Friday. What day of the week is that? That's actually the sixth day on the Hebrew calendar. He dies on the day we fell to restore the connection between heaven and earth. The miracle of the water into wine is about new creation transformation and about abundance in our life that we have in Messiah. But there's some practical keys to experiencing this for ourselves. You notice this miracle happens in response to Mary's request. She comes to Yeshua and says, the wine has run out. And he's like, mom, what does this have to do with me? And she's not going to take no for an answer. She expects her son to do something. She has faith and trust, and she has chutzpah, good Hebrew word, holy boldness and audacity. She's like, whatever he says, just do it. And of course, they fill the six stone pots of the brim and the miracle happens. Friends, when we know God has called us to do something, we can't take no for an answer. We have to have the faith and trust and chutzpah, holy boldness to keep moving forward and keep pressing in for the miracle to occur. Also something significant here, 
is you'll notice that the miracle doesn't happen until everything runs out. Oftentimes, God doesn't move until we've come to the end of everything. Because the reality is until we come to an end of ourselves, God can't really begin with us, which is so important. Don't get discouraged when you're at the 11th hour. That's often when God moves miraculously. And what this also should encourage us is that the miracle of the water into wine is taking something ordinary and transforming it into something extraordinary. Listen, in Messiah, we become a new creation. The old will pass away and the new will come. If we have faith, if we're willing to have chutzpah, if we're willing to obey, even when it seems crazy, what's gonna happen with six stone pots filled to the brim? God can move. And that should be an encouragement for all of our lives. But I wanna talk with you briefly about another miracle. We don't often think about it as a miracle, but it's the signs and the secrets of purification. One of the very next things that happens is that Yeshua Jesus goes up into the temple and Jerusalem and he overturns the table of the money changers. It actually happens twice in his ministry. At the beginning, in John, and in the other gospels, at the end of his ministry. What is so significant that is happening here? A key aspect of transformation is purification. There is a purging and a removing of the old in order to usher in the new. Purging is part of the process of transformation and purification that leads to freedom. But we have to understand the mystery and the secret of what is happening here. He turns the water into wine, which connects to Passover in the context, which is actually centered around four cups of grape juice or wine. It points to redemption. But how does this tie to him going up to the temple? Because he goes up to the temple and purifies it at Passover. And what we have to understand is that one of the key aspects of Passover is that it is known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This means that all the leaven has to be removed from the house. And it was the responsibility of the children to help clean the house and prepare it for the Passover. The temple was his father's house. He had to remove the leaven. He's not talking about bread leaven. He's talking about spiritual leaven. In the Bible, leaven becomes synonymous with sin. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? The physical removing of the leaven and the cleaning of the house for Passover was meant to symbolize that our lives need to be purified. We need to search our hearts. We need to search our minds and make sure that anything that is not of God is removed because it is the leaven that symbolizes the sin nature, the evil inclination that wants to keep us enslaved. But Yeshua died so that you can find freedom, sanctification, purification, the purging of the old nature and the old man so that in him you truly can become the new creation that he promises you, right? So that is good news. Yes, Passover begins with the redemption of Israel out of Egypt. God took Israel out of Egypt but it took him 40 years to take Egypt out of Israel. All of us have a little leaven in us. All of us have a little Egypt in us. But the good news is God wants to transform you. He wants to change your life, make you a new creation, and he wants you to experience the abundant life we have in Yeshua. He doesn't want you to live out of the lack, but out of the overflow, and that is good news.